This episode is brought to you by Experian. Are you paying for subscriptions you don't use, but can't find the time or energy to cancel them? Experian could cancel unwanted subscriptions for you, saving you an average of $270 per year and plenty of time. Download the Experian app. Results will vary. Not all subscriptions are eligible. Savings are not guaranteed. Paid membership with connected payment account required. Get the little ones, sit back, relax, and listen to the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated G for general audiences. The Red Panda Chronicles, The Sinister Simeon, Part 1, March 1940. The orderly's shoes clipped down the hall, away from his very important guests. The two men who had arrived just moments ago were dressed in white, like everyone he worked with every day. They carried impeccable credentials which proclaimed them to be visiting doctors, here to study rehabilitation patterns among those assessed to be criminally insane. Anywhere else within the city limits, that would be much too interesting to be a good cover story. Here at the Queen Street Lunatic Sanitarium for the Criminally Insane, it made for just another day at the office, and no one gave the visitors so much as a second glance. No one except the orderly who bustled down the hall on his felonious errand. He alone knew his guests were not what they pretended to be, and he had a general idea of what he stood to profit from their visit as the echoes of his hurried footfalls rang through the stark white antiseptic corridors. Back in the waiting area, a tall man glanced nervously down the hall. "'Are you sure about this orderly?' he asked the second man without turning. "'I am certain about nothing, Mr. Boone,' the second man replied smoothly. "'That is what I have you for, remember?' The first man turned to his companion and adjusted his glasses, which were strictly part of his costume. "'Forgive me, sir,' he said. "'I just—' When I was given this assignment, I didn't know it would be you. It raises the stakes. The second man smiled gently. He was slighter than Boone, but carried himself with an immense dignity that made him more impressive than his physique suggested. I appreciate the sentiment, Mr. Boone. However, my organization has done its research. Howard is in need of money to feed a minor gambling problem. However, he has no criminal record and is financially more stable than at least four other orderlies all of whom would be suspected before he was. He knows this. The amount of money he has taken in service of this deed is beyond his power to resist, but modest enough to keep him from attracting attention to himself. Hard times have made people simple and small. It has made them predictable and therefore easy to control. In time, they will choose to serve the new order of their own free will, and it will be the final time they have cause to use that phrase. Boone drew himself to his full height and nodded emphatically. "'Of course, Archangel,' he said. A shadow passed over the smaller man's face, and Boone knew at once he had crossed a line. "'I think we shall have no more need of that name,' he said. "'I am Dr. Ferguson, remember?' "'Of course, Doctor,' Boone said nervously, unconsciously patting the pistol in his pocket. Howard, the orderly, stepped back into the room at full pace, and both men took a deliberately casual air— which did little to dispel the tension between them. "'We're all clear,' he said, looking back and forth between the two visitors, not at all certain to which one he should defer. "'If you'd care to follow me.' He turned and began to walk back down the corridor, much more slowly, allowing the two men to stay with him without exertion. "'Is he able to travel?' Boone asked. "'Medically, yes,' Howard replied. "'Legally, of course, is a different matter.' "'Of course.' The third man said without humor. "'I can't really imagine what you want with this one,' Howard said with a shake of his head. "'There's nothing useful about him. Not like the others.' "'Others?' The question from the third man dripped with unspoken portent. "'Other supervillains,' Howard said, clearing his throat, "'who have, uh, taken a walk. There are rumors.' "'Are there indeed?' The third man sounded genuinely unhappy now, and Boone patted the pistol again as he walked just in case. No, Howard corrected, there are not. (laughs) I'm sorry. Boone turned and saw his traveling companion smiling tightly at the response. Howard cleared his throat again and stopped at a door. Watch yourself with this one, 
He's medicated, but only lightly, so he can move under his own power, and it'll wear off fast. His room inhibits certain stray brain waves that affect him. It's the world's worst superpower, but it makes him a handful. Son, the third man said amused, I'm absolutely counting on that. Yes, sir, Howard shrugged, producing a ring of keys and unlocking the door. Just watch yourself. He's a bag of cats. The door swung open to reveal a small, pristine room, and a pajama-clad, powerfully built man seated peacefully on the bed, his back to the door, looking passively out the window. The third man smiled warmly at the inmate's back. Mr. Cresswell, he said kindly, still playing doctor. Anton Cresswell, I wonder if we could have a word. The man's shape did not move in the slightest, but a tired-sounding voice croaked passively. Do you know what I did (laughs) to the last man who called me that? The third man glanced at Howard, who shook his head silently, as if to suggest they didn't really want to know. Boone spoke up in a very different tone. Step lively, convict, he barked. Time for some exercise. The man on the bed snorted but did not move. If you wanted me to take a turn in the yard, maybe you shouldn't have hit me with so much wowie sauce, he sighed. Boone turned back to the third man. Whatever we do, we need to do it quick. The third man looked at Howard. Have you got orderlies, he asked. Howard shook his head, horrified. Not enough. Certainly not enough crooked ones. This door shouldn't even be open. You have to make him want to move. Mr. Cresswell, the third man spoke again, his voice betraying more authority. It is time to go out and play with the man in the mask. Time for fun and games with the red panda. There was a moment of silence, but the man's shoulders seemed to shake with quiet convulsions. It took a moment for the laughter to become audible, but when it did, it quickly swelled to a roar full of hooting and gasping. The man turned round to face his guests, to reveal a face made up with the red and blue markings of a mandrill, and a maniacal grin that beamed like a neon sign that read, Crazy. Well, why didn't you say so? the mad monkey said, leaping up on the bed and springing into the air. Kit Baxter Fenwick stepped out of an enormous pneumatic tube labeled Downtown 4 and skittered down the steps into the underground lair of the Red Panda. Even in the winter, popular ladies' footwear was not a practical matter in the slightest, and when she wore the guise of girl reporter, this was one of the areas in which Kit was forced to compromise. Mr. and Mrs. Average Torontonian would have thought her winter boots were practical to a fault, but they had never sported a pair of static shoes that attracted and repelled everything they touched through the power of static electricity, controlled in perfect tandem by her almost unconscious gestures within her matching gauntlets. It was the downside of being a superhero, Kit knew, if anything could be said to be such a thing. Once you had done it, everything else felt ridiculous. She hustled across the tube bay toward the far wall and the shortest tube in the network, the only unlabeled one. Once upon a time it had bore a sign that read, Manor until the then-trusty driver had convinced her boss that if someone ever did get this far into his space, it made no sense to tell them which tube led directly into his house. He had labeled a lot of things in the old days, before he had anyone to talk to, and it had taken her most of their long, complicated courtship to break him of the habit. "'Is that you?' the Red Panda's voice came from a speaker somewhere above, bearing in mind that I have several television cameras that tell me that it is.' She stopped in her tracks and addressed the unseen voice. Where are you? You're supposed to be getting ready. Crime lab, came the echoing reply, and I'm always ready. She sighed and took her coat off, but folded it over her arm and carried it. If they were going to leave from the mansion high above, she would need to remember to bring it with her. Even their very discreet household staff would wonder if she kept disappearing and returning with forgotten items, and she tried not to press her luck. I'm sorry I'm late, Gus, she called as she approached the half-open door that still bore the sign, Crime Lab. We had a lead on a story that fizzled out and left us with a hole in the middle of page one. She trailed off as she saw him, bent over a microscope that was thoughtfully labeled Microscope. What the heck, she protested. He was in shirt sleeves, but he wore the crimson mask and gauntlets of his heroic dual identity, and the gray jacket and long coat were within easy reach. 
Do you know the Dark Angel has at least four minions who have burned their fingerprints off with acid? He asked without looking up. And you know this because? She asked, picking up her cues. The scars the process leaves behind are as unique as any other print in their own way, once you know what to look for, he said, sounding pleased with himself. That's bound to be a little disappointing for them, she offered. Yes, I'd have thought so, he agreed. I thought we were going to dinner, she said. He pointed helpfully to a clock on the wall, which was mercifully no longer labeled clock. The reservation was two hours ago, he said. Page one, remember? She sighed. I'm sorry, Gus. I wanted you to see me in something pretty. That's pretty, he said, because it was true. She snorted. Her outfit was rumpled from a long day at the office, her hands were ink-stained, and her hair was piled on top of her head and pinned in a deliberately random fashion that only he could possibly find attractive. It isn't, she argued. I need to change. He shrugged and reached for his jacket. There's a little gray number that I've always favored, he said. She wrinkled her nose in surprise. The squirrel suit? she asked. That still get your motor running? Literally all the time, he said, because it was true. That sounds exhausting, she replied in mock sympathy. You have no idea, he agreed. Thought we'd take the car out. We have an appointment at Riverdale Zoo. She did an abrupt double take. Please tell me you're joking. I have been called many things, he said, but hilarious has never been one of them. So much for date night, Kit sighed. Somehow, he protested. It always seems like date night. She smiled and vamped a little, just for him. Yes, boss, she said. The air was pungent and thick with the shouts of baboons, and Boone was finding it all just a bit much to take. His leader had told him that the mad monkey's powers, such as they were, were fed by the mental connection he had with these animals, but so far Boone was less than impressed. The animals themselves were the size of a dog and much more aggressive. They screamed at one another and threw things that Boone did not inquire into too closely, and their supposed leader did nothing to stop them or silence them or control them in any way. He had washed and dressed and taken a small nap to sleep off whatever medications he still had in his system, but if there was any criminal genius to be had, thus far it was not on display at the least. Boone cleared his throat loudly in an effort to get their guest's attention, but with the primate shrieks echoing around the largely empty warehouse they had provided Cresswell with as a headquarters, Boone was not at all certain that he had been heard. He coughed again. You should really get that looked at, the mad monkey said without turning his head. If you don't have your health, you haven't got anything. I was wondering if you had a plan, Boone said gruffly. The mad monkey spun around like a wild thing. A plan, he hissed. There certainly is a plan. I've planned it, and now I am doing it. The thing that I planned. It looks to me like you're laying around watching these dirty apes kill each other. The mad monkey snorted derisively. Shows what you know. They aren't apes, they're baboons, moron. And most of them do not seem to know one another at all as if they did not come from any one place. They know I'm the Alpha, but there is heavy competition for the position of Beta, and so forth. It takes time. Boone waved his hands in frustration. These animals were taken from zoos all down the eastern seaboard. It took weeks to do it without arousing suspicion. Yes, the Mad Monkey agreed. And then you swiped the ones at the zoo here in town at the last minute, almost as if you wanted to attract someone's attention. Or oh, am I wrong? Boone frowned. The organization I represent has gone to considerable trouble. I noticed that, too! The mad monkey rose, and the battle cries of his baboon army quieted as the creatures focused on their leader. But you keep making mistakes, like leaving that orderly alive. If I didn't know better, I would think this operation was not intended to be covert. There was a brief pant hooting of laughter that the villain managed to rein in with some effort. I didn't know you favored subtlety, Boone said, glancing toward the door on the far wall, wondering if he could make a break for it if he had to. That isn't your reputation. <laughs> and, 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 and what is my reputation, Mr. Boone? The monkey was laughing now in spite of himself. The organization I represent has had more than enough trouble lately from the man called the Red Panda. He is hindering our operations. It was decided that perhaps he's... 
greatest nemesis could be persuaded to outwit the masked menace and finish him off once and for all. You appeal to my vanity, the monkey said, straightening his eyebrows casually, which is a good idea. What is a bad idea is lying to me. I never, Boom protested. Don't bother denying it! The monkey was angry now, and Spittle flew as he spoke. The other one already let it slip. You wanted me to distract the do-gooder, and while he was preoccupied, you petty Hitlers would step in and finish him off! Why would he tell you that? Boone protested. My little soldiers can be very persuasive, the monkey grinned wickedly. What's left of him is over there, near the water trough. I think they're saving him for later. Archangel! No! Boone cried, stepping forward and then back again as the beasts focused on him suddenly. The monkey laughed again. <laughs> I wouldn't worry about that, he said. That wasn't the real archangel. He's dumb, but he isn't stupid. That was a stand-in. He told me so. He told me lots of things. Monkeys have that effect on people. He waved his hands theatrically, and his troops began to close in slowly. I wonder what you'll tell me. Why would you do this? Boone wailed in terror. Because I am eleven flavors of crazy, and nobody kills the Red Panda but me! He made a broad, expansive gesture with both hands. Boys, take out the trash! The chorus of screams returned, louder than before, and full of a chorus of cruel laughter. <laughs> Hi, this is John Bell. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. In my podcast, Bells in the Battery, I usually surpass a thousand words. Why does he? But for every episode, there is also a picture. You mean the itty bitty picture that you see when you bring up the episode? Yes, that's called a thumbnail. They're drawn on thumbnails? <sighs> But now you can see all the thumbnail pictures in large format by going to the Bells in the Bat Free Gallery. Just go online to thebatfree.com. That's T H E B A T F R Y dot com. And click on Gallery. That's G A L L E. I think they can figure that out. You'll see all the pictures for all the episodes that were created by Jeff Music, along with other guest artists like the Lava Lee Brothers and famous animation director Dan Reba. Oh, well, he knows one celebrity, and he really wants you to know about it. You'll also see lots of fan art art over the years, and a few surprises. So, when you're in the mood for a picture instead of a thousand words, especially, especially his, his words, go to thebatfree.com and click on Gallery. And be sure to clean your thumbnails before viewing. Music